In this unit, we're going to be talking about high frequency electronics. So this is obviously a very deep area with a lot of content. So we're not going to be able to cover a lot of stuff, but instead I want to sort of introduce some ideas and make you aware of certain things. So first of all, what do we mean when we talk about high frequency electronics? Well, of course, like with most things, this, there's not necessarily one right definition. Depending on where you look, there are going to be different definitions. But in our Stephen textbook, we define this for circuits that are operating in about the megahertz range. For circuits operating at megahertz or above. And so I believe Stephen actually specifically says greater than about five megahertz. And so what we're gonna see is basically as we move into these higher frequencies, we need new design techniques. And so we'll come back here in a second and say exactly why we need these techniques. But what we're gonna call these techniques are our radio frequency design. So radio frequency or RF design. And so that's going to be sort of what we're going to focus on in this unit. And so again, we, there, we can get into a lot more specifics. So as we get above our radio frequencies, we get into our microwave range and then into our millimeter wave. Um, and so again, we're just kind of going to touch on some topics in this unit without going into a lot of depth. So we, we know now that our high frequency means we're megahertz or higher. We know we need this new set of design techniques, our radio frequency design. So why is it that we need these new design techniques? So let's take a look in the rest of this video at some of the problems that arise with how we have done analysis as we get into higher frequencies. So our first problem, and so let me explicitly write here, these are our problems at frequency greater than our megahertz. So as we get into this RF range, so our first problem is that our lump parameter model breaks down. So lumped parameter model. And so basically what that is, is we said if we have a capacitor, it's just a capacitor and that's it. So we can treat this capacitor as maybe a 10 microfarad capacitor. And so what we're gonna see though, is at higher frequencies, that's not necessarily the case. So if we have inductors, for instance, there's also going to be some parasitic capacitance. So we have some parasitic capacitance associated with our inductor. And so as our frequency gets higher, what this parasitic capacitance is doing is it's going to be decreasing our inductive impedance. And then above some self-resonant frequency, it's actually going to behave like a capacitor. So above our self-resonant frequency, we have a, essentially a capacitor. So similar thing for a capacitor, we have a parasitic inductor. And again, keep in mind, this is just one element, one discrete element that we're considering, but because of sort of non-ideal effects that come into play, we say we have these parasitic components as well. So if we wanna model these more accurately, we need to include these as well. So we have some parasitic inductance associated with our capacitors. And so what that's going to do is decrease our capacitive impedance, because remember our capacitive and inductive, inductive impedances are oppositely signed. And so again, what we can say is above our self-resonant frequency, this is going to be acting like an inductor. So same thing here except we're just going to change that instead of acting like a capacitor. Of course, now this above the self-resonant frequency, this inductor is sort of taking over. And similar idea with our resistor. So instead of just treating it like a resistor of one value, we can actually have a parasitic inductance and a parasitic capacitance. And so what that means is we're gonna have some variable impedance that is changing as we change our frequency, which behaves like either a lossy inductor L or a lossy capacitor. 
depending on the specific resistor as well as on the frequency we're operating at. Okay, so that's sort of our first problem that we run into is our lumped parameter model breaks down. The second problem we run into is that we can't assume our signals travel instantaneously anymore. So we cannot assume signals travel instantaneously. So let's sort of take a step back and say, well, when we're talking about these signals, we're ultimately talking about electromagnetic or EM uh, waves. And so in an ideal case, let's assume a vacuum. So what that means is all waves are traveling the same speed of light. Travel at speed of light. And so remember that speed of light we usually say is C and it's equal to approximately three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Okay, so we had a way to relate this speed to something called our wavelength. So we can relate that to our speed and our frequency. So we said lambda, which is equal to the velocity over our frequency. So if we say our speed or our velocity is C, we divide by frequency, we can get this lambda, which again is our wavelength. And so remember our wavelength is of course the distance between sort of the same point on the wave before it starts repeating, but we can also think about this as the distance traveled in one period. So let me write that down here as well. So this wavelength is also the distance traveled in one period. So let's take a look at sort of some common values and see how that wavelength is changing. Of course, we can see it's inversely related to our frequency, um, but if we consider, for instance, a one kilohertz signal, then our signal is going to be traveling one wavelength in one millisecond. So our lambda, so our signal is traveling a distance lambda and so plugging in our C of three times 10 to the eighth, so I forgot to put my eighth here, um, and our frequency of 1000, we get that the signal is traveling three times 10 to the six meters, and so that's in one period, so that's happening in 16.6 .6 repeating, sorry, looking at the wrong table here, um, so that is happening in one, milli one millisecond. Okay, so now as we increase our frequency, so let's say we have one megahertz. So now we're going to have this signal traveling. So again, we plug in our speed of C and our frequency is now one times 10 to the six. We get that this is traveling 300 meters in one microsecond. Well, let's step this up a, a, another sort of three orders of magnitude and go to one gigahertz. And so in this case, what we have is our signal is going to be traveling a mere 0.3 meters in one period, but of course our period is much shorter at one nanosecond. And so it's worth noting that sort of assuming this speed of C, we're assuming that it is in vacuum. So we assumed vacuum up here. So our speed is always going to be lower than this. So this is our upper limit for our speed. So what that means is that our signals are actually going to be traveling smaller distances than what we have here in one period time. And so of course we can see as our frequency gets higher than this one gigahertz, we're talking about traveling no more than on the order of centimeters. So the smallest distance right here is 30 centimeters for one period. Um, so we need to keep that in mind as well. And so ultimately what that means then is that our KVL and KCL and any techniques based upon that. So let me just put associated techniques and that would be things like our node voltage method, our mesh current, all of that are no longer universally valid. So no longer universally valid. And that is, is just tied into this idea of our signals can't travel instantaneously. And so we can take this a step further and say, really it's difficult to 
unambiguously measure voltages above about 100 megahertz. So difficult to measure voltage and our current I unambiguously above about 100 megahertz. And so I should mention too that really this isn't as much of a problem with digital signals. Um, primarily we're gonna have issues with these types of thing when we're looking at analog signals. Okay, so that's our second problem. We can't assume that these signals are traveling instantaneously anymore, which ultimately means that we can't use our techniques like KVL and KCL across the board. We have to be a lot more careful with that. So let's look at our third sort of problem with our higher frequencies. And that is our active devices have limited, um, limited gain bandwidth product. So typically our active devices have some frequency limitations. And so typically those frequency limitations are going to be in the low megahertz range. And so I'll come back and make a note about that here in a minute. Um, <clears throat> but for example, let's say we have an op amp. And so let's say this op amp has a gain bandwidth product of two megahertz. So gain bandwidth product of two megahertz. So what that means is that if our frequency is above two megahertz, we can't provide any gain. So above two megahertz, no gain, because of course we can't have anything multiplied by two that's greater than one to get our gain bandwidth product of two megahertz. So if we operate at higher frequencies, we're just not going to get our expected amplifier operation. So of course we can buy uh, some specialized RF devices, but it's going to be more costly. So specialized RF devices, and so those can be discrete or they can be packaged and integrated circuits. Um, so that is available though, and these can go up into the high gigahertz range, but more costly. So we wanna keep that in mind. So we do have ways to work around this, but depending on the particular application, you might be trying to keep costs down, so that might not be a best option. Okay, so the fourth and final thing we're gonna consider is the possibility of electromagnetic radiation. And so that's not as bad as it sounds, um, but we'll, we'll describe a little more particularly what's going on with that. And we'll look at an example in, uh, in the following video as well. So possibility of electromagnetic radiation from the circuit. And so essentially what we're saying is it's the circuit is behaving like an antenna. So it's sending off some electromagnetic radiation into space. So this idea of radiation, you know, maybe it sounds a little scary at first. We're picturing sending these high energy rays out into space, but in this case, it's going to typically be lower energy. And specifically what that means is it's non-ionizing. So it doesn't have enough energy to be knocking electrons out of their outer shell, but we do still have some downsides. So it still can cause interference with other technologies. And of course, we're still losing energy from the circuit. So it can cause interference and it's lost energy. So of course, sending these waves, these electromagnetic waves out into space cost energy. So that's energy that's not being used for whatever purpose we want our circuit to be using it for. Um, so we're losing efficiency. So there are a couple ways that we can fix this. So we can fix, fix this with something called shielding. And so we'll look at that a little bit in our next unit on electromagnetic uh, interference. And basically the idea is we have some conductive enclosure. So specifically we'll look at, for example, coaxial cables. And another technique is absorption. So maybe we're not too concerned about losing the energy, but we don't want it to be going out into space to interfere with other things. 
so we can put some type of material around our circuit to absorb all of that electromagnetic radiation. However, typically the best sort of general rule that we have to avoid this electromagnetic radiation is to keep our circuit relatively small. So our best way to combat this is to make our circuit less than 5% of the smallest signal wavelength. So to make our circuit smaller than 5% of shortest signal wavelength lambda. And so we're going to come back and look at this in the next video. Um, but of course, as we saw earlier, our wavelength is inversely proportional to our frequency. So that means as our frequencies get higher, our circuit needs to be smaller and smaller. And so one thing that I'm going to touch on later, but I want to mention here as well, is that a lot of our RF design depends on physical layout of the circuit. So we could have the same circuit schematic, but with two different physical layouts, and they would behave very diff differently. And so this is one of those things we're not going to get into because it's beyond the scope of this course, but I at least want you all to be aware of that.